And to the third day in our celebration of the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, we have a, a celebration for every day of the mission from the 16th to the 24th. So we're going to make sure the astronauts get back. And we have uh, lots of all of our programs are shown on live stream and on YouTube. So feel free, if you can't make it here for a program, to watch it uh, on, on your computer. So let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the curator of the observatory. And uh, I'm here just to welcome you and to welcome our panel and to give you a few uh, tips uh, for success tonight. The first is, if you need to leave, you want to go out the back doors. Don't go out this side. That leads to an emergency exit. And if there were to be an emergency, we will lead you out through that. Uh, it's a little bit of a maze back there, so if you head out that way trying to get home, you may never see home again. So you don't want to do that. You also don't want to go to that side because it's a closet. And you'll try to open it, and then you'll feel embarrassed because you'll have to walk back up and walk past everyone. So uh, if you do need to leave, go out the back. Um, let me also say that you can leave your cell phones on if you like, but there is no signal in this room. And so your phones will be roaming and roaming, looking for signal, and that will wear out your battery. And then when you later want to post something to social media or call a, a ride share or something, you won't have any batteries. So we do recommend that you turn off your phones or uh, put them in airplane mode so they're not searching for signal and spending battery in that regard. Um, I do want to say a couple quick thank yous. I want to thank Friends of the Observatory. Uh, Friends of the Observatory is Griffith Observatory's partner organization that supports so many of our activities, most notably uh, our school field trip program for fifth graders. And, uh, but they support all sorts of things, the projector that we use here tonight, all of our equipment, uh, planetarium show production, all sorts of things that the observatory does. And uh, so we uh, encourage you to become a member of Friends of the Observatory. And if you are not uh, going to become a member, at the very least, perhaps you could put a little donation. This is a free program. So we encourage you to put a little do donation in the bins that are around that say help friend support Friends of the Observatory. And then lastly, and this is an unusual one, I'd like to thank the city of Los Angeles. And normally you wouldn't think that it was you know, too unusual, except we are a city park. Griffith Observatory is owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles, Department of Recreation and Parks. So you in Los Angeles have your own municipal observatory, which is a real rarity. That's not a common thing. But uh, a, a century ago, our, our leaders had the foresight to realize that it would be a wonderful thing for the city of Los Angeles accepted the grif gift of Griffith J. Griffith. And, uh, and now we have this beautiful municipal observatory. So we thank the city of Los Angeles and the taxpayers for the city of Los Angeles that make it all possible. So uh, lastly, I'll just say that um, we have a boatload of programs this weekend. On Saturday, the actual landing day, we have a festival day going on all day. Uh, short programs, half-hour programs at 11, 12, 1, 2, and 3 about the Apollo mission, about the moon, about the future on the moon, some of the things you will hear tonight, um, activities for kids, things on display, and so forth. And then Sunday <coughs> night, we invite you to come back for uh, another talk um, by veteran space journalist Leonard David, who has a new book called Moon Rush, and he will be doing a book talk and a signing, uh, a book signing, if you care to purchase his book and get it autographed. So that's uh, enough of the housekeeping, because I know you came here not to hear all these housekeeping announcements, but to hear something about our, uh, our missions and our faith in, move, in traveling to the moon. So with that, I'm going to hand over the program to tonight's host, Tony Cook, Astronomical Observer at Griffith Observatory. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Well, I, I chose to uh, put together this panel, Once in Future Moon, because I'm still trying to figure out what happened. Um, I grew up, uh, you know, I was born in 1955 and grew up in the 50s and 60s and stuff. And I remember I had a book called You Did Will you Go you? to the Moon. Oh. And uh, I'm wondering what happened. Yes. <laughs> in You Will Go to the Moon, uh, father and dad, well, I mean, it was the times, they say bye to mom, they get in a rocket, a uh, big Von Braun type three-stage rocket, 
and fly to a rotating space station where they watch baseball and flat screen TVs before they get on a lunar uh, lander that takes them to the moon. And then they, you know, go to a lunar city that's there and, and uh, look up at Mars, the next target someday. Um, so obviously uh, we're still waiting for that, I think. Um, so on this 50th anniversary of achieving the dream of going to the moon, I wanted to kind of evaluate the state of that dream, both where did it come from and where is it going. Now, for this panel, I've chosen guests who I've been very familiar with over many years uh, is kind of informing me. Um, Dr. David Livingston, in the center here, uh, is the host of The Space Show. Uh, any listeners of The Space Show here? Okay, yeah, wow. there, there are a few. Good. Well, I'm certainly one. And um, uh, they, the, the space show has been going since uh, about, what, 1999, 2000? 2001. 2001, okay. And uh, it, it has evolved into an a interview show of the movers and shakers in the space industry, sometimes uh, authors, uh, astronomers, amateur astronomers, uh, children's book writers, but anything connected with space. And uh, I would say it's the most uh, in-depth interviews I've heard. And, and uh, in a podcast format, it, it, you know, you have, what, three shows a week, I think, now, right? Or up to five sometimes. So up to five sometimes. So uh, it's how I spend a lot of my time, <laughs> either listening to replays if I can't hear it live, or I'm sure I'm awake at you know noon on Sunday to catch uh, that one when I'm free. Um, also, uh, uh, you're an MBA in uh, economics, right? Uh, you have an MBA in economics? MBA and a doctor of business administration and economics is one area. Okay, and also a sp an expert on, you did a dissertation on uh, on how, on space commerce. Commercializing space, um, this was back in 2000 when it was published, and back then commercial space uh, was always there because pulling Lockheed, uh, Northrop, the big companies, they're all commercial. We don't have nationalized businesses in the United States. But they did contract work for NASA, and they weren't necessarily entrepreneurial. But all of that world has changed. But when I did do that, commercial space, things like space tourism, were a total laughing stock. And you could find Newsweek articles and Time articles laughing at, at people who advocated space tourism, or entrepreneurism wasn't even talked about for space back then. Yeah. What a different world. So uh, kind of thinking ahead on what lay ahead for coming dec for the coming decades. Um, now, uh, Warren James, I uh, also uh, listen to a great deal. You run the Hour 25 uh, radio show, which is now a podcast, and uh, also had a long history of interviewing authors and, and movie makers, and also some of the same guests David has had, astronauts. I remember you interviewed Gunter Vent also. Yes. And, and, uh, I wonder about Gunter Vent. And, and also, in addition to that, uh, actually Warren currently runs a really great uh, uh, science fiction movie show at the Pasadena Public Library that's free of charge. On uh, once once every Saturday, I mean I'm sorry once a once month, month on Saturdays, and uh, also uh, he's also from Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, okay, McDonnell Douglas Space Systems and McDonnell Douglas Astronautics Companies, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I also understand you own an asteroid mining company. Right? Don't well not <laughs> own an asteroid mining company, but a consulting company. Okay. <laughs> and I am one of the few people, probably the only person in this room, who's been paid money for asteroid mining. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... What? Oh, you want to check your mute? I, it's, it's not set to mute. Is he good? Okay. It isn't set to mute. Yeah, and I think I hear you okay. amplified. Yeah. And then uh, Rod Pyle. I know Rod... Uh, now, I wouldn't be here without Rod, and that's why I call him Dad. That's a little no, weird, isn't no. it? <laughs> Actually, 
<laughs> no, Rod, Rod was a guide supervisor here when I showed up here in 1978. You had to and, say the uh, year, didn't you? <laughs> applied to, for a guide position, and uh, he was one of the people. Actually, I got interviewed twice because I lost the paperwork the first time. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. But we knew you were smart, so we just wanted you to come back and answer more questions. Right. Also, I had to learn how to drive. That was one of the things I was told between the two interviews. So, so it inspired me. But anyway, um, so uh, Rod hired me here. But Rod also was a movie maker. You, you involved with making various forms of media, including DVDs, things like that. But also, he's uh, a space author, and historian. Uh, some of the books he's written include uh, uh, Blueprint for a Battle Star, if I've seen that, Amazing Stories of the Space Age, Missions to the Moon, uh, Heroes of the Space Age, which I had the honor of just reading recently, oh, good. and also Missions to Mars, which details all the robotic missions, and First on the Moon, a new book, right? Yeah. And Space 2.0, which is on the current commercial space situation. So very broadly knowledgeable and uh, fun to listen to. You've probably heard him on KFI. Uh, he's Bill Handel's uh, go-to space guy. And Bill I really Handel's like whipping it. boy. I, I really like it when, you know, Bill Handel likes Rod's sense of humor and dryness and explaining things. And, I mean, and, and public great uh, talent in explaining things. But he'll get somebody from JPL on who tries to be funny, and that interview lasts about 30 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so you hit the right chord with Ron. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so uh, what I'd like to start this with is, um, you know, going to the moon is an ancient idea. It's not something that was thought up in 1957 or even right after that. But it actually goes far back, and I thought Warren could tell us a little bit about uh, some of the ancient ideas of going to the moon. Where did this idea come from? Can you say, yeah, what well, would you say about it? I mean, we have been telling stories about going to the moon for about as long as we've been telling stories. I mean, you can go back to one of the oldest one was from the second century, and that was Lucian of Samosota. The story was called True History. And basically, he was satirizing the stories of Homer and, and other stories of Greek mythology. But you can, you can track through following that. You can go into the Middle Ages, into the 16th and 17th century. Johannes Kepler, the man who came up with the laws of planetary motion, one of the big three of the Copernican Revolution, he wrote a novel called Somnium, in which someone travels to the moon during, an, during a, a lunar eclipse assisted by a demon. He writes this story about a you know, magical trip to the moon, and then later this book is used as evidence to prove that his mother was a witch. <laughs> and so he ended up having to defend his mother for, against the charge of witchcraft because of this book. Um, and he was Sir, successful in that defense. He was successful. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cyrano de Bergerac had the story Voyage to the Moon, in which he, he, tried, he went to the moon a number of times using various techniques. Uh, bottles of dew which would evaporate and then drag him to the moon. Geese, he tied himself to a bunch of geese that migrated to the moon conveniently. And eventually he actually had one other method. He used um, rockets that were strapped to a cart that took him off to the moon. I mean, so you know, all of these people came up with these stories of the way to the moon, but they, they really weren't stories about the moon as we know it. It was just, you know, another fabulous tale. Now, in terms of fabulous tales, coming over to this country, Edgar Allan Poe once wrote a story about going to the moon. It was called The Adventure of One Hans Befall. And he wrote this as a story that was going to be serialized in the newspapers and basically run as a hoax story about this man who came up with a, a, an amazing balloon that could take him to the moon. Now, what's interesting was he had a, his person travel to the moon using a balloon but he knew that there was no air between the Earth and the Moon, so his inventor had a vacuum compressor that would compress the vacuum into breathable air. Um, <laughs> however, Poe put out this story, and then, right around the time his moon hoax came out, um, in, uh, I think, the New York Sun, there was another story which was called, conveniently, a moon hoax, but it was about the, the discovery of an amazing new telescope that had looked at the moon, and they, they were 
having stories about all the amazing discoveries on the moon, about moon creatures, moon animals, moon civilizations. This went on for several months. Edgar Allan Poe figured he couldn't compete, so he never bothered <laughs> telling the rest of his stories. Um, but we really started moving into science fiction about the moon in a fashion that was relatable. Would have been Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. They kind of bookmarked the Victorian era, beginning and end of it. Um, surprisingly, even though we think of Wells as a 19th century author, First Men in the Moon came out in 1901. So he's actually an early 20th century author. Um, how did he get to the moon in that? <laughs> uh, magic. Magic. Cavorite, <laughs> yeah. uh, a, a substance that blocks gravity. Jules Verne launched his people to the moon in a giant cannon. And he, and he actually thought of a number of issues and questions and problems. They, they launched from a site in Florida that is literally down the street from Cape Kennedy. And he knew it had to be there so that it could actually reach the moon. He, uh, he had, uh, they had accommodated uh, the need for air and oxygen and food and water on the trip and everything. They were mistaken about zero G and things like that. When would zero G happen? But his biggest problem was using a gun. <laughs> um, the acceleration required to go from zero to escape velocity and the length of a giant cannon is high enough that it would just totally squash you. So he <laughs> tried to get it right in terms of science and got it wrong, and Wells didn't even bother trying to get it right. He just invented this magic stuff and went off to the moon. Now, I mean, we get into the 20th century, and science fiction authors kept going back and forth to the moon over and over again. Uh, Robert Heinlein uh, started off a whole series of young adult novels with his book, Rocket Ship Galileo, mm -hmm. which has not gone out of print since it first appeared in like 1949. And it has been constantly in print since then. Um, now you mentioned the, the, the method that he got to the moon that was by well, rocket. Now the, now. now the interesting thing yeah. in rocket ship Galileo, they actually got to the, to the moon in a rocket ship. But the, the fascinating thing about it was that the characters in that novel lived in a world where rockets were commercial entities. These, these boys, you know, basically build a rocket to go to the moon, but they didn't do the whole thing. They bought a used cargo rocket that had <laughs> been previously used to fly mail from one side of the world to the other, and then because the one of them had an uncle who was <laughs> knowledgeable in such things, they came up with an atomic engine and off they went to the moon. Now, but the whole idea of using rockets had to do with other developments that were going on too, yeah. right? Well, this yeah. came out right after World War II with the V2s and all the other rocket developments, so. But even before that, though, in Russia, it wasn't in, uh, Rod uh, Tsiolkovsky? Tsiolkovsky. Yeah. Tsiolkovsky. Yeah, so people started actually doing real math on it. And then in the United States, we had Robert Goddard, who was mm -hmm. developing liquid fuel rockets. Shiley. That inspired yeah. people in Germany to <laughs> make mm. rocket clubs. Right? Well, if you, wanna, if you want to kind of skip from books to movies, the big inspiration on that, that would have been in Germany, the film Fra im der Mund, which uh, was a film done by um, Fritz Lang in 1929. And that was a story about a trip to the moon. And that was done with Hermann Oberth as the technical advisor. And that one, that story, that film presaged a lot of things that happened in... Uh, because Homer, uh, Oberth actually calculated what technical Oberth, things Oberth was the technical done, advisor. Right? The rocket that they used actually resembled a rocket that was described in one of Oberth's, Oberth's books. Giant rocket built inside a large building and then rolled out to the launch pad and then launched uh, off onto the moon. I mean, it, with it, a water, suppre with sound a water suppression system. With a water sound suppression. <laughs> and yeah. if I recall, the villains were evil <coughs> capitalists, weren't they? Um, in that one? Um, the, actually, the, well, yeah. The, actually, the, it was probably more precise to say the villain was an American. Oh, <laughs> bullseye, yeah. okay. No, I mean, actually, the way the movie worked out, the first part of the movie, but the first half, is um, a tr an industrial espionage thriller. And there's a company trying to, a group trying to stop the moon, moon expedition because 
They were going to the moon for commercial reasons. They were going to mine <laughs> oh, yes, gold. They were, well, they, they were going to mine what kind of book valuable talk resources. Here, aren't we? That's good. <laughs> In their case, they said gold, but uh, I thought it was very prescient. They actually yeah. were going to the moon for a commercial reason to mine something of value. And this American company, which uh, I think owned a lot of gold stock, basically wanted to control the gold market. Um, so. Yeah, it was the bad guys were Americans. <laughs> so, who who is who is inspired very much by this, or involved even with this well, movie? Well, Oberth was a technical advisor. Werner von Braun, were, Oberth had gotten a contract to actually build a liquid fueled rocket and fly it for the premiere of the movie. Um, Oberth was a brilliant theoretician and a lousy engineer. <laughs> um, I almost I've said he almost had a nervous breakdown trying to get this done. But Von Braun worked on this team building a liquid rocket for the movie. Uh, Billy Lay worked with him. So they worked on this. They didn't manage to get anything done for the premiere of the movie. But then this movie became the inspiration for much of the, uh, the German society of spaceflight. Okay, now going on from movies then to uh, what technical developments kind of were coming on at this time. You had German rocket clubs, right? You had the German rocket clubs in the, all through the 30s, and then this kind of led to the, to the V2 and, and the other right. German rockets. Because uh, basically Germany, after World War I, was prevented from developing known weapons like battleships, airplanes, tanks, yeah, the treaty traditional things. So uh, they had sneaky ways of getting around that. When Hitler was coming into power, he, he transferred uh, airplane development to airliners that were carried out um, in Russia, I guess. And, um, and then rockets were a new thing that weren't weapons yet. So they, they weren't mentioned by the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah. So they were able, so the German army developed large artillery rockets. The V2 was first, was the, the first rocket. So the army took over the rocket clubs. The, the army took over the rocket clubs. They, <laughs> well, they actually, they did several things. They took over the rocket clubs. Um, the, the the German Society of Space Flight had a rocket flying field, and they would fly rockets um, for public demonstrations on the weekends to earn money. People <laughs> would pay money to watch them fly rockets. The German army closed that, um, and then the German army thought, well, this this movie. People might get ideas from it, so they tried to, to grab up all the prints of the movie and the <laughs> props and models and all the other things. And so, but the people working with Von Braun and others on development of V2, um, they were all inspired by, by this movie. And one of the first V2s to be launched had the movie's poster That's taped right. to its side. Now, Rod, can you mention like how, how were the rockets actually used in World War II? The V2. to kill people, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. they were yeah. They so were they were weapons, they were so. kind of a, a, another form of artillery that was supposed to be a little more accurate and long range. So they'd launch them towards targets like Antwerp and London and other cities that the Germans didn't like very much. No. And they weren't terribly accurate. They weren't terribly effective, and they were really expensive. No. Werner von Braun was really good at talking them up, right? I mean, he well, as he <laughs> said, with I think it was the first. Actual launch in combat where they where he said uh, the rocket worked perfectly it just landed on the wrong planet, <laughs> from which the FBI later concluded when he came to the United States, we can't say he's immoral but he's certainly amoral. That's right. And no other uh, problems are associated. Hitler with that. budgeted roughly half of Germany's military budget to developing rockets, which was actually good for his, real good for us his, his, in the uh, 60s, enemies, yeah. right? Or his, those he was fighting because. Uh, Basically, they weren't that effective as weapons. They came in way too late in the war to But it be is effective. interesting, when, when you look back at how brilliant they were, and this is a slight diversion, but it, it does involve space travel, because I wrote a book called Amazing Stories of the Space Age, which has a <laughs> sub subtitle that includes Nazis in it. Um, they talked about traveling to the moon. They talked about building, before World War II, they talked about building a giant mirror in orbit, which was supposed to light dark harbors and make it safer for people to walk in cities at night. But of course, most people suspected they were going to be used to burn down cities in, in Western Europe and other places, which is certainly part of what they're planning. Interestingly, they were going to keep their soldiers alive by growing pumpkins in orbit because they could give them oxygen and pie to eat. I'm not kidding. So you imagine these Germans with, 
with helmets and later hosen and gloves, and they're they're you know grooming their pumpkins. It's a very strange <laughs> picture. It's not easy to make a pumpkin. And they also um, <laughs> were planning a space plane back at that time. This is the mid 1930s. Uh, there was a gentleman who was a, kind of a competitor of von Braun who was planning a, a skip bomber. So they had a lot of really good ideas that they probably couldn't pull off with that technology, but it really fed into what we did finally do. So even, even though those weapons weren't terribly effective against... Or practical, yeah. Yeah, and, and Germany lost the war, those became a big target of both the Soviet Union and then the United States. Mm -hmm. um, David, can you mention what happened? Well, wh one you, of the things yeah. that uh, has always caught my attention is that in interviewing so many scientists, and I did get to interview most of the living German scientists that came over on mm -hmm. paperclip that worked in the space program, and those interviews are on the archives. They're, they're all gone now, of course. And um, the older people were really inspired to go into rocketry, which is usually the term that they use because the more modern terms weren't really being thought of back then, by a lot of what Warren and what Rod is talking about, what went on in World War II, and the early days of paperclip when we started experimenting with the V-2 and doing more things with different rockets. They didn't have a real space industry to inspire them. They had a lot of science fiction. They had a lot of literature, they had some films, and they had these really great minds that were stellar pioneers in the field. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to the people who go to Apollo, and then what came after Apollo, they got inspired by the real thing. But when I get to talk to them, they still say science fiction and what you've been talking about and what Rod has been talking about. That was their initial introduction. That was their initial inspiration. Science fiction has played a very big part with physicists and astrophysicists and astronomers and engineers, and it still does today. And they all know these books and these films going back. When I do science fiction shows, they're going back with lists that are over 100 years old. I mean, and people really do know this stuff, and they they live it, I'm, you all are probably familiar with the X Prize, and Peter Diamandis put the X Prize together years and years ago, and he was struggling to raise the money, and the first X Prize was the suborbital space flight that took place with, uh, in Mojave, and he, people would say, well, what's your business plan, Peter? What, what kind of business plan do you have for this thing you call the X Prize? And he'd pull out a worn, paperback, you've probably heard the story, of Heinlein's, the man who sold the moon, <laughs> and he threw it on the table and said, this is my damn business plan, you know, or something to that effect. And he used Heinlein and that book to inspire him and get people to invest in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, X Prize organization. Now, backing you know, up days. a little bit in timeline, uh, so after World War II, we have big aerospace industries starting up. Starting yeah. up. And um, rockets were developed for a number of reasons. One of them is that also another development out of World War II were, of course, nuclear, thermonuclear weapons. And airplanes were not the way to deliver those. They, uh, they can be shot down and stuff. So rockets were thought to be a much more, uh, well. Well, no, <laughs> the, 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 the issue with nuclear weapons and rockets and airplanes, the original nuclear weapons were really large. Um, and they were too large for any rocket of the day to be carried. So America carried them on airplanes because we had big airplanes and we had friends where we could base our airplanes close to the Soviets. Soviets had no friends in this hemisphere. They couldn't get their, their airplanes to carry nuclear bombs to America. So the Soviets had to go with rockets. And because the problem was they were so early, the, the nuclear bombs were so big, they had to build big rockets. In fact, they, I guess, preceded the, the nuclear bombs in the sense they actually miscalculated how big they would be. So the, well, their biggest rocket, the, which is the Soyuz of today, um, was twice as big as it needed to be to carry any nuclear yeah, weapons. But they, so. but, but they originally, <laughs> they were going to have big bombs, they needed a big rocket. America said, 
you know, we got airplanes, and we know the bombs are going to get smaller. We'll wait. So one point I'd just like to bring out is uh, after World War II, you know, the Soviet Union was an ally in World War II, but one difference they had from other countries is all of the countries they moved into to clear the Nazis out or, or any belligerents out, they took over the um, the uh, what became the NATO nations had a different tack. They would restore countries to their previous sovereign sovereignty, I guess. Uh, and that was a very big difference. And it really became a great fear arose that the communists would try to take over the rest of the world. And we were maintaining, you know, we weren't going to allow that. And, it almost, and then that led to the Cold War. So a lot of you are probably too young to remember that. But... Uh, I remember I grew up, uh, and we all grew up with bomb drills and stuff. Uh, Duck and cover. Yeah, we, I think, grew up knowing that we were probably would be incinerated by a hydrogen bomb. I mean, that we were drilled into thinking that we would at least experience that. Now, you so, grew up in Riverside, right? I grew right. up actually in Claremont. Okay, because I grew up in Pasadena, and I remember walking to high school one day, and it was a Wednesday, and the air raid sirens went off, and they only tested them on the last Friday of the month. So it's Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock, and I'm hearing these air raid sirens thinking, oh, I guess this is it. Nowhere to go. I'll just sit and watch the show. And then years later, um, after some Soviet information got released, may have been after the fall of the Soviet Union, I saw a targeting map for Pasadena. And there was a big red circle around JPL, and a big red circle around Caltech, and another big red circle around the old Naval Weapons Lab, which is over near the east side of town. And the three of them overlapped right on my house. <laughs> I thought, I'd be yeah. gone like that. And if I just made one more thing, in those days, for those of you who don't remember drop drills, which is most of you, they would have the whole classroom climb under a desk that's this big. It's a quarter inch of formica, and that's supposed to protect you from a 5,000 degree thermonuclear explosion with a big glass window next to you. It probably wouldn't have worked, but they tried. So, so anyway, what I'm trying to say is rockets had kind of a bad rap in, yeah. in one way. Uh, they, we were afraid of them. Um, you know the Sputnik story. In 1957, the Soviet Union was the first to launch uh, a satellite. Now, both the US and the Soviets had plans to do it. It really wasn't a secret. It was part of the International Geophysical Year. Uh, you know, that was one of the goals of it, that countries would start orbiting satellites around the Earth. But uh, I think the, so the Soviets were shocked at the reaction of the Western world, which was, they're flying over our cities. You know, this could be a weapon that might be destroying us. And uh, so there, space suddenly became a very big worrying thing to a lot of people. And we, we felt we were behind in that development. In spite of all the in investment in aerospace companies and stuff, the Soviet Union was the first to, to actually orbit a satellite. Um, so a competition developed between the two. Do you want to say anything well, about um, that? We would have been first, but Eisenhower did not want the military, which would have been the army with von Braun, to launch the satellite, which would have been Explorer 1, which eventually was launched and was very successful. So he chose to go with Vanguard, which at the time was a civilian rocket, and everybody By built, the Navy. built at the Naval Weapons Lab. <laughs> and, and, right. Right. and everybody remembers this pencil on the launch pad, <laughs> boom, and beautiful smoke and fire. Right. And, uh, on, we, on international TV. On international TV, because yeah. we broadcast everything, failures and successes. The Soviet Union only let you see successes. And uh, so the Soviet Union was first with, um, with Sputnik, but had we gone ahead and gone with the Army's rocket and Explorer and what von Braun wanted to do, he probably would have been. And first. I've heard there it may have been other reasons for Eisenhower not letting von Braun launch a rocket first in that. He really wanted he, I think he, the he initials SS to, had something to do with that, maybe? We said, well, the initials good. SS had something to do with that. Well, he had that a bit or, of a reputation. Or also just that, uh, Wait, you know, we didn't want the Soviet Union be, to be the first to accuse us of flying over them and spying on them and causing yeah, there international ruckus. There was a, there was a real question. Um, was it illegal for a satellite to fly over somebody? Mm -hmm. Because it's illegal for an aircraft to fly over another country right. without that country's permission. And they figured if the Soviets did it first and we didn't protest, then we're cool. And if this was settled years ago with the famous lawsuit on the Bolivia Convention, when. 
uh, they got the U.S. got I think it was the U.S. that was sued for overflying Bolivia with geosynchronous satellites, <laughs> and uh, they said they were in their airspace, and of course it never made it uh, to a victory, and they've been flying over everybody's territory ever since. Uh, I'm sure Elon Elon Musk must be relieved with but the that thousands was of satellites. Long, 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 long time before <laughs> Elon Musk came on. The, the scene, but they really didn't want the army to be, and maybe the SS had a, something to do with it back in those days to be the first to go to, to space for America. Now, when you had the uh, when the Soviets launched Sputnik One, they didn't think it was a big deal. It, it was it, it was I'm not I think it might not have even been on the front page of Pravda. It was just a little note on page two. You know, Soviet scientists launch artificial Earth satellite. Then the American press hears it, and it's like big deal. You know, so the, the Soviet scientists had launched it. They went home. It's like, well, cool, but no big deal. Then the American press goes crazy. And then the next day, front page headlines on Pravda. Soviets launched first satellite. But it was very interesting. People didn't think it was going to be a big deal, and then it became a big deal. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit too young to remember that because I was like, let's see, two years old when Sputnik went. But I, I came here when I was four years old. And as you know, you have to be five years old to go to our planetarium shows. <laughs> so I, I stood outside with my grandmother while my parents watched the planetarium show. So I had to know what it was you could see when you were five that you couldn't see when you were four. So when I was five, I came here and saw the planetarium show. And uh, in, as part of the show, uh, Dr. Clement Chow gave almost all the shows, uh, simulated how the Sputnik that was up at that time would be visible later that night over the city. So when we got home, uh, we went, ran outside, and sure enough, we saw the probably a booster, actually, of, of one of the rockets passing over. So, I mean, it was a big deal. And actually, the point I want to get to is that it became a competition. You know, of course, we launched a satellite a few months after uh, after Sputnik, and then they, they launched a dog with their second satellite, and you know, and it went back and forth until 1961, when we were about to launch our Mercury astronauts, who got launched, but Yuri Gagarin. And I remember walking around the block with my dad, who worked for General Dynamics, one of the defense contractors. He said, so he walked around the block. He never took me by the hand and walked me around the block, so I knew it was something big coming up. And he goes, there's a man in space. He's a Russian. His name's Yuri Gagarin. I go, OK, Dad. And I saved the Time magazine, which had Yuri Gagarin on the cover right after that. But so, so then, of course, we responded with Mercury. And, and we get up to the Kennedy era. So uh, <coughs> we, we kept seem, seeming to be behind the Soviets always in, in this thing. And we always you know, we, we prided ourselves in our technology and stuff. So what did Kennedy do? In fact, you use it in your show all the time. What, what, what did he commit us to in well, 1961, he, after he, Alan Shepard's flight? He committed us not for space reasons, by the way, mm -hmm. not for any of what all of us are probably real interested in, but to defeat the Soviet Union and show the world that Western technology and science was more advanced than anything the Soviet Union was doing. So he said, we're going to head off to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. So that was his famous... Rice University speech, but he gave a speech earlier to Congress when he made a short appearance, which really put the moon program on the map about a year earlier. Now, my, my kids hear but, me listening to the space show all the time, and they know that speech they know Kennedy's by heart speech. because it's always short to start your show. Um, I, but anyway, so he, the he development. should be alive and give that speech today, not because it's easy, everybody out there, because it's really hard, and it is hard. No, at this time, I'm in elementary school, and it just seems so exciting to me. And I, I thought about it, you know, if the president's saying we're going to be on uh, the moon while I'm in high school, wow, that's really exciting. But then I got sad because I thought, well, you know, that, that'll mean people won't get to Saturn until I'm probably gone. It's too slow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I remember thinking that one day for some reason. But I wanted to show you this. Uh, maybe some of you are regulars to All Space Considered maybe have seen this, but I had a Viewmaster slide set from 1964. And I wanted to show you that by 1964, the plans were congealed enough that um, 
or they'd come together enough that we had a pretty good idea of what would be involved. There'd be a huge rocket called the Saturn V, and it would carry three astronauts and an Apollo space capsule and, and service module and a lunar module that would be a special spacecraft to land on the moon. And this is one of the early designs of it. And uh, it would carry an astronaut, you know, carrying a flag. Now, this is interesting because NASA didn't even decide to put a flag on the moon until April 1969. But in 1964, they knew that the astronaut would put a flag on the moon and, um, and then find really beautiful gold and red glowing moon rocks. <laughs> and then they'd uh, land in the ocean. And obviously, they didn't know about the, uh, you know, biological protection garb they'd have to wear. But um, then they deliver the rocks and a vial of moon water directly to the president. So <laughs> had that only happened. So, um, so we, of course, landed on the moon. We're the 50th anniversary of that. This is actually the Apollo 15 mission, but this is sort of the high point of lunar exploration where a car was taken to the moon. Astronauts could drive three miles from where they landed. Uh, we had color TV of it. Um, and, I mean, what do you guys remember of the excitement of going to the moon, say on Apollo 11? Well, I'll take a turn because I'm on the course. end. Okay, yeah. go on the end. And I'm younger than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Barely. Um, so I was 11, and I remember the build-up to that intensely, as, you, as I'm sure you all do, because we had been following, if, if you were a space fanatic, I mean, most of us probably had friends that were trading baseball cards and football cards, and we're sitting in darkened rooms reading space magazines and space books and trying to keep up with what's going on. But it was an incredible moment because we had already had Apollo 8, which orbited the moon in 1968 in December, which was a watershed moment. And really, in a lot of ways, a, a much more dangerous mission because, of course, they had no lunar module. It was still too heavy to fly. So they're out there on the moon with just the Apollo capsule and the rocket propulsion unit. And they're in orbit. And if anything goes wrong with that engine when you push the go button, if it doesn't light up, you're there to stay. So that was a big moment. And of course, they read Genesis while they were in orbit and got a lot of people on Earth upset by doing that. <laughs> and then uh, Apollo 11 flies, Apollo 10 fly, 9 and 10 fly to, to test out the hardware. And then Apollo 11 flies in July of 1969. So probably we all did the same thing. You dragged every TV you had in the living room. They're about the size of a washing machine with a screen about this big that wasn't square. And it was kind of rounded and weird looking. And we watched these kind of green and white images of uh, the moonwalk. And it was, it was something. It was something to watch your father cry. Yeah. Because they didn't do that very often. And I, I, my hair stood up because I remember why you could see the astronauts walk their go, those ghostly images on TV and setting up the flag and all. And I could look out the window and here's the yellow crescent moon setting. And I, just that feeling, there's people there. You now, know, let just, me tell you what somebody else very kind of famous thought. So for this last Apollo book I did, which uh, I'm sure will be back in your bookstore sometime soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to interview a couple of the astronauts' kids, so I interviewed uh, Andy Aldrin and uh, one of the Armstrong boys, Rick Armstrong. And uh, both interviews were interesting, but I'd known Andy for a long time, so I got to talk to her about an hour and a half. This is Bud, Buzz Aldrin's son. And so when the interview was over, usually when you interview, I interviewed, I don't know, 30, 40 people in the last year for a couple of books, so at the end of the interview, I said, is there anything you want to add? And usually people say, yeah, that's about it. It's been an hour and a half. Let me go. You know? And he said, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you something I never told a writer before. I'm like, well, yeah, please. That's what we live for. He said, when my dad was walking on the moon, I saw the way he was jumping around. And I know a lot of people were wondering why he was doing that bunny hop thing. And I knew exactly why he was doing it, because he's an intensely scientific guy. And he wanted to see when he landed where his center of mass would go. And he wanted to watch the, the little bits of dirt travel away from his boots in an arc in the low gravity with no atmosphere, which is what Buzz said later he was doing. He also said, but I wasn't worried about my dad because I knew the spacesuit wouldn't rip because NASA was the very best. And I knew the lunar module wasn't going to strand them because NASA tested everything. He said, what worried me the most was looking at that wire that went from the lunar module to the antenna dish that was pointed <laughs> at Earth. It was kind of coiled up. It wasn't lying flat on the lunar surface. He said, I was scared to death my dad was going to trip over that and embarrass me in front of my friends at school. <laughs> I thought, you know, 
Eleven year boy, year old boys, the same everywhere. So that what was his you, reaction. What were you doing, David? So um, the, the I watched it from a hotel room with some friends on a little black and white job with rabbit ears. But uh, to a lot of us in uh, in the Apollo kids, uh, the Apollo generation, that there, first of all, there's a huge disconnect going on here, and which has led to us feeling cheated and robbed, which you might hear in interviews from a lot of people. But, I mean, you didn't feel cheated and robbed then, No, right? well, <laughs> but, but we thought that this was the opening to really being spacefaring. We were going to go to Mars. We were going to have people living in space. Thank God we finally got there because our interest in going to the moon had nothing to do with the Cold War and national security. It had to do with that we really loved space. We loved all these science fiction films and books and things that Warren and Rod have been talking about. We were schooled on it. And oh my God, here's the introduction to real time. And now Mars is at our, is at our fingertips. And maybe we'll get to go someplace else or to Saturn or something else. None of us expected what ended up over this 50 year hiatus. And it was the opening door to our dreams. Yeah, I, I have to say, uh, I, when I turned 13 is when the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey came out. And I, that was a birthday present to me. I got to go to Hollywood to go see it in a big theater. And yeah, I, you know, I'd grown up watching all of the space missions and stuff. And I just believe, well, I got to watch this because that's what 2001 is going to be like. And I'm going to be going. growing up in that, you know. Yeah, and this and was the opening salvo. So I accepted salvo that would be really and, and what we was going got robbed on. somehow. Well, so also, we think. you know, there was there. So there were the promises of that film and others like it. Yeah, right. They, right. They told us we were going to have a base on the moon. We were going to have moon buses. We were going to go out to Jupiter and see, you know and see go to LSD live on Mars and everything. And all the yeah, they did in that movie that were weird. But beyond that, you know, we had von Braun and his people promising us Mars by the '80s. And even for Apollo, if you follow the, the, the Apollo Applications Program, that was kind of stumbling along during the late 60s to try and find something to do with this hardware after the original 20 lunar missions were finished, or through Apollo 20, we were going to have a, a habitat on the moon. We're going to have a roving habitat. There's going to be a LEM upper stage on a, on a lunar rover so that you could drive around and somewhat pressurized comfort. You couldn't sit down, but at least you could drive around. <laughs> um, and they were going to, they were talking about having Apollo missions, Apollo-based missions, that would do flybys of Venus and Mars in one mission. Yeah. You weren't thinking land. Cold War national security. This was the opening to this our space This was just heaven. opening the solar system. Right. And it was kind of promised, you know? If you read the popular press, if you read Time Magazine, if you read Newsweek, and it all got taken away. Yeah. But, it was, but it was but it was never there. It it was always it about wasn't the Cold my War. Mind. It was <laughs> in our it was mind. In yours, yeah. Yeah. No, it was in our mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Warren, what, what, what was your the reaction to the time? watching Apollo eleven? Well, right. and you also conflated two thousand one with it. Yeah. Um, I saw two thousand one, I was a couple years older than you. I had gone and it was showing in St. Louis in Cinerama. Not seventy millimeter, not it. Honest to God, multi-screen Cinerama. It was wonderful. Um, but I'd gone downtown, gone to a used bookstore. I'd bought several books about space, including one by Croft Ericke, and uh, another which was an old Air Force manual on missiles and rockets. And then I went to see 2001. I thought it was pretty good, and it would do until something better came along. <laughs> Did you understand the ending then? I'd read the book already, so I knew oh, it was well, coming. Oh, we cheated, okay. Well, I, and, the, the, and, I, and I love the movie. I mean, I've probably seen the movie over 100 times in the cinema and have it in every format ever made. Um, and I still think the book's better. The, the book is exquisite. Well, the book and makes I, sense. And I would love to have seen 2001 with the ending that was in the book, not the ending in the movie, because... Frankly, you get to the when you get to the Stargate sequence and the psychedelic light show, it's like that's when I go out for a smoke. <laughs> and, you know, it's like I mean, at that point, the, for me, the movie is over at that moment. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, I'm 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 done with it. <laughs> but uh, even though every, it's your favorite movie, even though it's my favorite movie. You know, what, one other thing from that time though too we should remember is that Star Trek. Uh, also, when did that end? Sixty-eight or so. Seventy-seven. Something not. Sixty. I was at uh, sixty-five. Sixty-six. No, it, maybe sixty-six. Yeah. It might have. I don't know. No, they, they, they have a they have a Saturn V launch. It actually it actually got to nineteen sixty-nine. 
69. Okay. 69. So that was also of this time. Of course, that was third season, and we don't talk about that. And, the, and even though pe people were building real Saturn Vs and stuff, a lot of those people were also very inspired by Star Trek. They, they thought they well, were establishing Starfleet. Can I Starfleet. add, if you go to a NASA field center, <laughs> I work at JPL off and on, and um, if you want to start a food fight in that cafeteria, just say to any table with more than four or five people at it, Okay, Star Trek or Star Wars, which one's stupider? <laughs> and they will go, first they'll go at each other's throats, then they'll go at yours. But they're both, both groups, depending on the age you're talking about, are really inspired by those shows and, and, and by those movies and by the Apollo program, even, even young people today. Or if you want to really get a fight, classic Trek, next gen. Oh, well, that one's easy. Or, so, you know, I, I worked on next gen and I didn't like it. So I would say yeah. both, <laughs> both, both, um, both Apollo 8 which was the first time people went around the moon, and then Apollo 11, where people actually walked on the moon, was, you know, you could tell it was not whether you were interested in space or not. It was just a, a human achievement that was incredible, and, and people really did camp out in front of their televisions and stuff. Uh, you know, the television coverage was literally, you know, uh, Non-stop for for days, right? Uh, with yeah. Walter Cronkite and all, and, and uh, so just incredible. But you know, by the time you get to Apollo 12 in in November 1969, well, first of all, there was a technical reason, to, Rod, but why? Uh, so why, we're uh, we're we excited because they're going to have two moonwalks. There's a color camera going up. It's much better resolution than Apollo 11s, which you could barely see what they were doing. <laughs> Well, we're very excited, and poor Al Bean, who's the, the second guy, or the second guy in that mission on the lunar surface, is deploying the camera, and they had not had a chance to practice with the camera during, Apollo was moving so fast, pretty soon they'd be flying every two months or so. And so they had been working on their simulations with a block of wood on a stick, which they pretended was a camera. So this is the first time Bean's actually handling, handling the real camera to any extent, and he pans it past the sun with the lens cap off. And there is this streak, and then this weird shape on it. And for the next 10 minutes, he's trying this, he's trying that. They finally take the hammer, and they're banging on the camera, and nothing's happening. So they finally admit that it's dead, and Apollo 12 becomes a radio show. So if I may, for just a moment. Yeah. So CBS has a couple of guys at Grumman Aerospace in Bethpage, New York, in their lunar simulator, big concrete surface. It's got craters. It's got a limb. It's awesome. They got a couple of guys in... Suits that sort of look like Apollo. You could tell the backpacks are cardboard, but they're pretty cool. So they're walking around trying to look like they're in low gravity, you know. <laughs> and everything's a beat behind what the astronauts are doing. And then these poor guys, because Pete Conrad was kind of a jokester, so he keeps saying, hey, Al, give me the universal tool. I want to hit something. <laughs> that was his term for the geology hammer. But these guys down at Grumman don't know what the heck it is. They're like, what's the universal <laughs> tool? There are people going through their flip boards. They have no idea. So they finally figure it out, and they do their thing. ABC had not prepared quite as well, so they dispatched somebody, as the legend goes, to Western Costume to pick up a couple of costumes, which weren't, you know, they weren't quite Twilight Zone, but they were close. I'm not sure they even had gloves. I can't remember. <laughs> but they were a little funky and a, a backdrop that's kind of waving in the wind. But NBC took the prize. NBC had hired the guy who did the marionettes for The Sound of Music. So, so they've got this, this little painted backdrop and this kind of plaster of Paris Mountain, and they've got these guys walking around like this, <laughs> and every time Pete would say, hand me the universal tool, they'd have to cut away to a picture of the earth for a few seconds, and they'd cut back, <laughs> and somebody would have taped a hammer in the hand of this thing, and he's doing this. So I worked on, there, there was a, you all probably saw, or a lot of you saw the CNN Apollo 11 movie. There's another one that came out shortly thereafter, done by National Geographic, which I worked on for a few months. And they said, if you could have your dream met for this film, what would it be? Because they were covering all the missions. And I said, to find the simulation footage from NBC for Apollo 12. <laughs> and we looked for six months. And we finally got a hold of the archivist from NBC who said, we burned that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not there. But what I think was most remarkable, you know, you're talking about impressions when we were young. So we got through Apollo 12. We, we listened to the rest of the mission. And that was exciting. Then Apollo 13 comes along, and I hope I'm not, not moving oh, beyond I, here. I'll, I just want to say the Apollo 12, I liked radio shows, and actually that one was one of the most vivid to me because you later ones you could see 
great TV and stuff, but they walk away from the TV, so you couldn't always see what they were doing and stuff. But in Apollo 12, that was a very talkative crew, and they were best friends and right. were jo cracking jokes all the time and stuff. So even though there was no TV, I actually re remember that one probably <coughs> better in an intimate way than some of the later missions. Well, radio so, is a more intimate medium yeah. than TV because so, it happens in your head. So you then we have Apollo 13 emergency. And these guys barely get home alive, and we'll probably talk more of that, about that. But it's exciting. The networks are thrilled because the ratings are going through the ceiling, because these guys might die. <coughs> a little ghoulish, but that's how TV networks think. I've worked for a lot of those people, so I, I understand that. And then Apollo 14 comes along. So I'm staying home from school. Did your parents let you do that? No, actually, I talked the school into setting up a TV that was in the teacher's oh, you in, in an empty <laughs> classroom so that our, us moon watchers could watch it. And I wrote my own sick note. What, my, myself and one other person watched it out of yeah. the whole 5,000 people. Because most school. of us who were really that much into Apollo only had one or two friends. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I'm sitting at home, actually with no friends, I think about it, watching Apollo 14, <laughs> and they're halfway up the crater which they're never going to get to the, to the summit of. They missed it by like 75 feet. But they're halfway or most of the way up the crater, and the networks cut away. They cut away to General Hospital. They cut away to Days of My Lives. They cut away to I Love Lucy reruns because the ratings were dropping, and they knew they were losing ad dollars. And I felt so betrayed, and I've never forgiven But part of that. that was they walked out of the field of view at the beginning of that walk. I don't care. And then, and then I wanted to hear yeah, it. Yeah, but you, could, you were looking at just a blank picture. So all you all don't was you really Don't you apologize for these the, guys. I'm still I mean, it was the moon, yes. But, yeah, OK. They but but I, I thought it was no, they did kind not. of a boring no, TV agree. transmission. You know, we, we were a unique group of people that had a a vision and a dreams, and as I said earlier, Apollo was opening the door for that, but others didn't share that, and it was not a universal time of agreement. There were people mm -hmm. in the country that didn't want it. They didn't want to spend the money. There were protests, and uh, there were uh, lots of people objecting to it. So it wasn't a slam dunk, uh, hunky dory, everybody's on board as people think. Now, the teams that did it were clearly unified and had great leadership and, and in order to make it all happen, but the public had a lot of the same issues going on with it that we have today with going back to the moon. And interesting you say it that way because we were talking about this earlier. Public support by poll numbers is almost the same now as it was then. It depends on which questions you ask, of course, but if you talk about do you support a strong American space program, you get one answer, which is about 54%. It just went up over 50%. Right. If you say, do you support sending humans back to the moon, then the numbers start moving all over the place. And, and but David, the support's you, very similar. You had mentioned uh, uh, something about your brother's attitude towards some, at least, I don't well, know if it's Apollo he, 13 or, or I had what, a lot but, of friends and relatives that were in Vietnam when some of this was uh, going on. And they, especially, I remember Apollo 13. And the world was stopping everywhere to watch. and big screens all over department store windows, all over the ward, world for updates on bringing the Apollo 13 crew back. And that people in Vietnam were saying, you know, we're getting the hell blown out of us all the time here. And, you know, we're getting rocketed and our people are getting killed and nobody cares about us over here. And you guys are worried about three people going to the moon and getting back. There's a, a disconnect. So there, there were disconnects in the American society. The Vietnam War was a very big one and the economy was a very big one. And um, we're thinking that Mars is our, you know, our oasis. It's right in front of us. We're gonna be there in 10 or 15 years, you know, with Von Braun's spaceship. And this is wonderful. And uh, I mean, space to a lot of us of the Apollo generation was about space and not about American leadership and national security and Cold War victory and things of that nature. And we put Vietnam out of our mind. We put some of the struggles with civil rights that were going on at the time out of our mind. The thing is, I mean, you're talking about, you know, how the Apollo generation feels cheated. Um, you know, we didn't get Apollo applications. We didn't get the, the MOLEM or for the really, really weird concepts, the mobile CM. There was a design for a command module on wheels that would have been landed on the moon. But anyway, <laughs> but, you know, so we feel cheated because we didn't get the future that we thought we were being promised because Apollo was this bold expedition into space. It was opening the space frontier. 
the problem is that wasn't what Apollo was. Apollo was a political activity. It was done for political reasons. It had nothing to do with opening the space frontier. It had nothing to do with our future in space. It had none of those things. Apollo was a political activity because it was designed to do something by a certain date. And, 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 be and first in this, down case, the moon, in this <laughs> case, to do something was go to the moon, get there before the Russians, and as soon as Apollo did that, it had accomplished its goal. And that was our and that And that was, and that's, and that, that's how the politicians looked at it. And, that, and that's how our disconnect was. Yeah. That's our disconnect. Okay, but now we, we, know, think now we think down Apollo down was the start <laughs> of something yes. big. And the, the people that, that ran Apollo, the people that created Apollo, the people that got the money to do it, that's not how they saw it. It, it was but. just a political activity. That if it was no different to them, if it was who could pick a million avocados first, uh, it it was that it, that it went to the moon meant nothing to them. Because but I think David has some points about the economics of it, and I just like to point out that between the American, uh, between NASA and the Soviet Union in the 1960s, they did almost all the heavy lifting that's enabled the the rocket barons of today. Musk and Bezos, they've evolved those designs, but the heavy work was done then, the low-hanging fruit was I mean, picked then. I mean, and then people said that, you know, Apollo was supposed to prove the superiority of the American, the American system. It didn't do that. <laughs> we were better communists than the communists were. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you look at the, at the Russian program, they had a program to land cosmonauts on the moon. Mm -hmm. The problem was um, they couldn't cooperate. The, uh, the the chief the the chief the designer who was in charge of their engine work hated the, their chief designers. Glushkov hated Glushko hated Sergey Korolev. Korolev hated Glushko. Might be because Korolev believes that Glushko is the person that turned him into the KGB and got him a trip <laughs> to the Gulag, which almost killed him. The, so those two people hated each other and they wouldn't work together. So Korolev had to go off to someone else to get engines. Someone who had never built a rocket engine in his life was building the rocket engines for the Soviet moonship. And what and while, happened to and that? Cor <laughs> they, they actually, they turned out to be bloody good engines. Yeah. Um, so, but Korolev is, has got his L1, N1, L3 program. Uh, Glushko is pushing his own concept. Another designer is pushing a third concept. So even though they're, you know, they're supposed to be focused and working on getting to the moon, they've got literally three competing projects that are undercutting each other fiercely. America, which is, you know, supposedly the land of the free and the home of the brave and all the other good things, we, we acted like good communists. <laughs> Everybody got focused, got together, teamwork, and, and, and as a unit, went forward and accomplished the goal. And I just think it's hilarious that, that someone jokingly said we were better communists than the communists. But yet that was, that was what it was. We, we were able to get together, work together, and cooperate, whereas the collectivist Soviets were constantly squabbling over <laughs> who was going to be on top. So David, I, I know you're probably getting ready to take a break, but let me say a few things about what Apollo did do. Because <coughs> there has never been a government financed and run program that has even come close to doing what Apollo did. So Apollo includes Mercury, Gemini, and um, Apollo. Apollo, and it's roughly around 1962, 1963 to 1973. It spent $25 billion, that's usually the number that is agreed upon. You can find numbers up to $33 billion. you can find numbers that are a little less. $25 billion in 2019 dollars is roughly 153 billion dollars. So that's what Apollo would have cost if we were doing it today. What did it do? It created 420,000 new private sector jobs, not government jobs, private sector jobs. It started countless new industries and technologies. It ushered in the digital age. The digital age did not exist before Apollo came about. It changed the medical field with things like pacemakers, transmit, transmissions in ambulances to be able to communicate back to a hospital with an on-the-scene uh, accident or en route. 
all sorts of different things. But they ran economic multipliers on the, econ the economy for Apollo. So an economic multiplier attempts to do what the private sector does all the time and determine return on investment, except for government, you don't have traditional returns on investment. So you're, you look at jobs created, you look at technology advancements, you look at all sorts of things, including intangibles, like um, inspiration, for example. So the lowest economic returns were five to one by a student group out of Arizona, SEDS, most of the banks and the professional econometric models turned in returns of 14 to 1 to 20 to 1, meaning for every dollar the government spent on Apollo, they got $14 back or they got $20 back. The most incredible returns came in at 340 to 1 for very specific things like zinc-rich coatings and technology, pacemakers, and a few other very high-tech things like in the digital age, those were off the top. Now, Apollo stopped in 73. People are still starting businesses today. People are being inspired today. At the ISDC meeting I attended with Rod in September in Washington, D.C., I probably met 30 or 40 people that told me that they had started a business because they were inspired by Apollo. So they're not inspired by the space station. They are not inspired by the shuttle. A few really like the planetary programs like going to Pluto and things like that. They're starting businesses because of Apollo. They're getting PhDs in engineering today because of Apollo. Not a damn cent has been spent on Apollo since 1973. And, and can I just add one well, thing? Well, just let me. Well, if I may just. Okay. How many of you have interacted with a computer today? <laughs> okay. Some of the first people to actually interact with a computer who were not programmers and things like that were Apollo astronauts. They had to operate their, their spacecraft from a little keyboard that they could type in very simple instructions to make it do its thing. And that miniaturization, the keyboard concept, all of that stuff was done for the Apollo capsule. So I think actually in some ways maybe the, that ratio of investment to, it, it's, it, it's it almost might be impossible more intangible. To, yeah. to calculate. So this is the AIAA's monthly magazine, uh, Aerospace America, and this is their current issue. So there's two things I want to point out in it. There's two young women that have little op-eds in it. So this one on this page is starting UCLA Aerospace Engineering. She's inspired by Apollo. She's starting Aerospace UCLA Engineering 2019. This gal, inspired by Apollo, is doing planetary work at the Applied Physics Lab with Johns Hopkins and doing planetary work with NASA, inspired by Apollo. Come on, 50 years later. When I initially did this research, which was back in 2005 for a conference that I spoke at, I compared Apollo to an entitlement program, which was a school breakfast program, and I compared it to a really great successful infrastructure program, which was Hoover Dam. So I'm not saying these are the Apollo's the only way to go for a, a government project. That's not my case at all, because it is important to do a lot of other things. But when that last dime is appropriated by Congress and authorized and goes through the pipeline on the school breakfast program, it's over with. And it's really hard to test what happens afterwards because you'd have to start comparing groups that didn't get a breakfast, got a better breakfast, got a breakfast but not as good a breakfast. And I mean, you couldn't really get outcomes that could tell you how successful that program was 20, 30 years later, 15 years later. Hoover Dam, a great program, paid off its bonds ahead of time, was instrumental in winning World War II. It produced the power to build our ships to be able to defeat the Japanese. It was incredible. They put it in with a conglomerate of other power generators in the West. It was a turkey. They broke it back out of that. But the problem with Hoover Dam is you have to maintain it. You have to remodel it. You have to upgrade the generators. You have to clean the dredge and the silt out of it. So it's got operating expenses that continue to rise with the cost of inflation. So it's not a net net all the way through because if you don't maintain Hoover Dam, it's not gonna keep doing what it does. Apollo keeps doing what it did 50 years later without a dime being spent on it and it's doing it today. In Every reason to expect 
that if you have a good program going back to the moon and Mars, and good is in big bold letters with quotes, you can expect something comparable coming from it. Um, and maybe when you come back from the break, we can talk yeah. about a good program. Why? I mean, we have spent billions of dollars on the space station. We spent bill billions and billions of dollars on well, the on the space well, shuttle. I can not, tell you what I, my I, research I, I, found out. None of them created inspiration. Is this well, uh, I have to say, yeah, I, we, we need, need okay. but there is one last point I'd like to make on that, to that. Uh, I remember in 1972, a little newspaper article that President Nixon was going to start something new called the space shuttle. And the space shuttle was going to make space practical. We've had this excitement of going to the moon, but the space shuttle was going to be like a space truck. And I thought, wow, that makes space boring. I mean, it, you know, I mean, putting it down in that terms made it seem like, as much as I was a fan of space, a space truck didn't exactly remind me of the Orion in 2001 flying to the space well, station. It was <laughs> when I did this research, I came up with 11 items that made Apollo different from other programs. So I don't know if you have time for them or I could. We probably tell them shouldn't quickly. right now because we do need to take a break, and uh, we'll, we're going to take roughly 11 minutes. So our uh, so we'll resume the the live stream uh, right after that. Uh, because we, we've got a couple break videos. And I've arranged these break videos uh, before we talk about the future of exploring the moon. Um, one of them is a beautiful view from the South Pole of, of what the sky looks like from there. Um, it's about three minutes long. You don't want to miss the second one, which is a beautiful little film about going to the moon, a future trip to the moon. Um, and uh, I think you, you definitely want to see that, too. So if you're going to take a break, go quick first. <laughs> and and uh, we'll be back in about 11 minutes, and, uh, and we'll continue our discussion.
There we go. Well, welcome back to the uh, last portion of our uh, panel today, Once in Future Moon. And no, I'm not crying. Uh, and you guys, <laughs> no. how many of you had seen that before? Anyone? Uh, that, that, was a, that was a film that was just premiered, uh, I think, last year. Um, actually, we downloaded it on YouTube. Uh, it, it was the first production of Tycho Studios, which was uh, animators from formerly of Disney. Uh, I think they worked on, there was a big giant or something. What was the? Iron Giant? I, uh, no, not Iron Warner. Giant. There was a, another giant robot. Oh, giant robot or something, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. I, that. I, I didn't see it actually. Iron actually. But, but the, the Yes, I think so. Big Hero 6. Big Hero 6. That yeah. was sweet. But the, these broke off independently, and they formed a joint uh, Los Angeles-Shanghai company. And they premiered it. I saw it in a little theater in Al or Actually, it was a bookstore in Alhambra, but it was going to go to the Cannes Film Festival. Oh, was that Nucleus? Uh, Tycho is the name of the no, company. No, the bookstore. Oh, I don't remember. Main Street? Yeah, I know. It could be. It, it was, had a lot of artwork and stuff there. But... Um, I asked the people, because you know, it was a premiere, uh, if, who was this movie aimed at? Was it aimed at American students? Because I don't know that many kids who are that gung-ho in being astronauts. And he said, well, honestly, it was to our Chinese audience, because China right now is like the late 1950s was in the US in terms of enthusiasm for space. He said, the future is their oyster, if that's the right exp expression. And, um, and space is, I mean, people are really crazy for it right now. And they said that Elon Musk is just as big a rock star in, in China as he is here, and maybe even more so, because uh, people are very inspired by anything to do with space. And he's doing the most exciting stuff right now. So. Uh, so that's another thing I think we need to keep in mind is that just because our kids aren't necessarily that gung-ho about space doesn't mean that people in other parts of the world are not. I just saw a terrifying story. Um, they've done a survey about what did kids want to do, what, what jobs did kids aspire to. And in China, over half of them aspired to being astronauts. And in America and the UK, the number was only like 11 percent, 10 percent, but something like 30 or 40 percent of the American and UK kids wanted to be YouTube's YouTube stars. Yeah, and so a statistic that kind of aligns with no, it's not a statistic, but a number that kind of aligns with this is David was mentioning the ISDC conference earlier, which we were both at this year, and I helped put together, and it's uh, run by the National Space Society. And each year we're getting more and more students, and we're up to about 480 now out of a total attendance of like 1,300 people. And almost all of them are from India and Eastern Europe, not Western Europe. And there might have been, I don't know, 12 from the U.S. Yeah, but it just worked out that way. A lot way. from Romania. Yeah. Because I rode the elevators up and down with them. Yeah. No, there were a I, lot of Romanians there. I, I have to say, in my own family, I, you know, whenever the space show, Well, your kids space, didn't have a chance not to be no, Tony, let's be no, honest. No, but, but I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, what, what did I do to, to inspire them? I, I don't make them do astronomy and stuff. I, I, you know, that's if they want to, fine. But I did take them out, like when the space station is passing over, let's go out and look at it. And they see it, they go in the shadow, they know all about it. Jeff, and of course, we watch launches, yes. I mean, and there, are, there are things that we do together as a family. But I have to say, one day my daughter was looking at, uh, who's now studying astrophysics, by the way, looked at the space station and said, Dad, how come we're the only people out here? How come everybody's not out here looking at this? This is incredible. And all I can say is, they're, well, their parents aren't bringing the kids out to look at it. It's not that it's not incredible and... That okay, but there's two <coughs> sides to that coin. I All took right. my kid to rocket launches. I took him to a shuttle launch. I took him to an Atlas launch. Are you watching, Connor? I took him out for meteor showers. We fought off wild, ki rabid coyotes. Uh, we, I took him to museums. Where else? I took him to NASA facilities and so forth and just tried to infuse him with this stuff. And he was very polite about it, but 
not happening. You know, so I think it just depends on the kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You true. rolled the dice and you won. Congratulations. <laughs> but when my uh, youngest son was four years old, uh, he watched the space the tour of the SpaceX factory. And his eyes lit up when Elon Musk showed that the employees there can get free snacks. Guess right right yeah. off the shop floor in the restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Free snacks. I can go work there. And then later on, uh, we watched the Virgin Galactic, the films they used to show of what it would be like to float in the, in the you know, uh, spaceship too. And he said, wow, we could do that. How much does a ticket cost, Dad? And I said, $250,000. Well, buy a ticket then. I said, we'd have to sell the house. <laughs> yeah, but we'd have tickets. Could you buy two? And yeah. And he said, well, where would mom and, and the girls live? And they go, well, it's okay. They'll find another house. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, but he's, he actually is 14 now and he flies a plane. So, I mean, he doesn't have a license yet, but he's working on it. So, <laughs> so, so I mean, things you can. Your enthusiasm does, it can, it doesn't guarantee it. I have two kids that couldn't care less about space, too. But, uh, but you know, I mean, they respect it, but they don't, it's not their, their passion. So, but you have to expose kids to lots of things and find out what their passion is. And one thing that I can't believe people can't get passionate about is space. And, and if you don't try oh, believe it. showing them. I do a lot of overnight radio. And no, but I mean, most people don't. I don't see. I don't see calling. other. I don't see other parents out showing their kids the sky. So I, it you're not giving them work, that man, chance. I'm telling you. No, I know. And maybe and I'm not saying it always does, yeah. but it certainly doesn't if you don't try. Okay, so we got to let these guys have their. Yeah, yeah. I'm you're sorry. Two enough time. That <laughs> Just they could be at each other. Take a minute. I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll finish what I was okay. talking so about you, with the research I did on what constitutes a good program. Like what caused Apollo to have this kind of staying power. So um, I came up with 11 items, and you can debate them and dismiss them or accept them, but uh, one of them is that the program did have a unified vision. Now, maybe a lot of us thought the vision was we're going to go to Mars and live in space, but there really was a, a, a vision, and it had to connect with people, and it did connect with people to beat the Soviet Union in the Cold War. People were really afraid of the Cold War and of their kids doing duck and cover tests and hydrogen bomb protection. I mean, that was uh, actually a real thing, and th this was part of being able to defeat that. It was an inspirational and motivational film, uh, motivational program, and it had years of workup up to it because it followed Mercury, and th those astronauts were really wild guys, and it showed them with Corvettes and fancy cars and flying <laughs> jets and all sorts of different things as part of the PR ensemble that just engulfed the astronauts from the very beginning uh, up until the program shut down. And it was inspiring for lots of people, and kids wanted to be like Neil Armstrong and Gordy Cooper and everybody knew their names, go into almost any high school in America back then, and we knew the Mercury 7. I mean, I, I don't think anyone in this room can name five astronauts today, probably myself included. Um, <laughs> the program had to be inspiring and motivating, um, and it had to go outside the space industry for that inspiration and motivation. So uh, it wasn't just people within the industry that were glued to it. Leadership, and this is really key, because not only did you have leadership coming top down from the government, but you had team leaders in the companies and in Apollo and the work team and the small groups. They had leadership. And Gene Kranz, who all of you remember maybe from the Apollo era, just testified last week before Congress on how to go back to the moon and what did he do during Apollo that we don't have today. His testimony you can find online fairly easily. It's all about, he said, the lack of leadership today and the lack of unity in the country. And he stressed how they had unity and leadership down to the very lowest level of leadership in a team of four people. Everybody knew and they had great leader and great unity. And that's missing today. And that was existing back then. The program had strong goals and they were clearly stated, as Warren was saying a little while ago, even though a lot of us thought the goals were to go live on Mars, the program knew what the goals were, and 
and uh, the government knew what the goals were and the people running the program knew what they were and maybe a handful of us thought the goal was we'd get to go live on Mars one day but the rest of us were not in this dream state and, and knew what it was. So goals are in, important. The program has to have quantifiable results and Apollo and Mercury and Gemini did and the project people were accountable for their role and nobody wanted an accident and then in the accident investigation to find out that they screwed up and it was their part or whatever they did that caused the accident. So they were accountable down to the very minute level. They really did not want uh, failure. And uh, the results, you could quantify the results. You could see the outcome. How many things that we do now today, we don't even know what the outcome is. And maybe the outcome disappears. Um, the project cost, and uh, they did pay for the, for the program. And um, the variables were under control. And then the rest was history. They, they, you can't even contain the cost and figure out what it's going to cost to go to the moon today. So they say 30 million, but maybe if the internationals come in, it'll be 20 billion. But then for government work, you usually have to raise it because of delays and other things. What is it really going to cost us to, to go to the moon? Nobody knows right now, but they're asking Congress uh, to fund a $30 billion program. Um, Apollo w was much more finite than that. And it was challenging. As Kennedy said, we go because it's challenging. And uh, it was challenging with technology and engineering. We didn't have it back then. Uh, today, you know, Musk and Bezos and people, they're on the, sh on the shoulders of giants that really blazed a trail in all of this. But the guys in Apollo, they had to create it. MIT had to solve coding problems for the computers to work for Apollo. It's the whole big story of <laughs> Apollo, is what the MIT computer people were able to invent and create. The people that were involved, it's got people that took responsibility and led and created all the way from the top to the bottom. Economic benefits I mentioned, it was nonpartisan. We're in such a highly partisan state in our country today and so divided that it's not thinkable that we could have a bipartisan approach to going to the moon for the good of the country. Um, and long-lasting benefits in Apollo, Benefits, they still show up in econometric models today. People starting businesses, employing people, creating new technology, inventing new uses for things. And so those are some of the attributes that go into making a great program. And it happened to be for Apollo. Is it a one-time thing? And I hope not. I hope we can recreate all or some of this moving forward yeah. to go to the moon and to go to Mars, but I think the verdict is out. But uh, I, I sure hope it can be done because I think we need it for the United States as well as for the world. And we'll go on now to discuss a little bit about the future of the moon. And uh, one thing I wanted to say is I remember a uh, number of years ago listening to KFI that John and Ken were talking about one of the Apollo anniversaries, and they said, why did we stop going? And they said, well, there was nothing on the moon that was interesting. It was just <laughs> rock, rock, and, yeah, and in a way, they were kind of bright. There was certainly nothing that most people would find beautiful. I mean, I, I think the moon looks beautiful through a telescope, and, and there's certainly some features on the moon that, that are, are, I think, most people would find exotic and beautiful. But the pictures we saw from Apollo of these kind of rounded, dusty hills and rocks and craters and stuff weren't, you know, it didn't make you want to rush to live there. And, um, <laughs> and, and the conclusion we came immediately from Apollo was the moon was dry, there was no water, um, things like that. Of course, we only explored really this a very limited amount of the equatorial part of the moon. Um, uh, now, this image is, you know, somebody's fanciful vision of what, you know, it could be like a couple centuries from now, say, in a lunar crater. So let's see how we could go maybe from now to, to that. Um, one thing is, you know, after the, the North and South Pole were reached, those were international competitions. People dreamt of doing it for a long time. They got there, and then they stopped going for decades because it was very hard, but there wasn't anything that interesting or beautiful of, in, in a traditional kind of sense there, only if you really liked ice a lot, you know. Um, yet, 
it wasn't for decades when people finally had good airplanes that they went back to the South Pole and then and then now we have research stations there. So, you know, it's gradually come back, but that's because there was a scientific reason for doing it. We, we, it isn't, you know, nobody's going to be first to the South Pole again, but it, it's a um, it's a important place for studying the, the, the Earth. On the moon, um, we really didn't go back to the moon at all until the late 1980s when a military mission called Clementine uh, was demonstrating some new radar capabilities and maneuvering and flew over the poles of the moon, partly to do a NASA experiment to see if there was ice there. And sure enough, the radar signals in the permanently shadowed craters of the, especially around the south pole of the moon, showed a possibility of water ice on the surface. So south is to the left in this? I think, um, uh, no, I guess not. South is on the left, north is on the right. Yeah, okay, I'm yeah. Mistaken. I believe so, yeah. And uh, so that suddenly got people excited. Now, I, I was working here late. People had left the observatory, but UPI called. And they said, what, what's this about water on the moon? I said, well, I didn't hear about it. What's the news? And they said, well, now the Air Force is saying they found water, on, on, water ice on the moon. Why is that important? I said, well, well, you really should talk to Buzz Aldrin or somebody like that. So I, I had Buzz Aldrin's number at the time, and I called his house. He was off to go see a Mars launch in Florida, so he wasn't there. But I said, well, they're going to be covering it in, in Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Call them. They said, okay, yeah, we'll do that. But what, just briefly, what, what is it? And I said, well, gosh, if there's water on the moon, you could, have, you could put settlements there. You could build lunar cities and stuff. You can make fuel, all kinds of things. Said, all right, well, thanks. Headline next day, Griffith Observatory <laughs> spokesman says cities could be built on the moon with water found there. And I, uh, there were editorials in Australian newspapers saying, hmm, astronomical observer. Well, that sounds like a wine, you know, fine wine type of job, you know, and, and all that stuff. And, and, and uh, John and Ken on the, on the show, I heard them as I was driving home, hmm. <laughs> what cities on the moon? What's this guy talking about? And stuff. But they probably extended say, but they can't even get their potholes and their streets repaired, right? Because right. they're big on that. But you know what? It, repairing potholes never inspired anybody to go into STEM. So I, I, I'm still with you. So, on that one. so anyway, but the thing is, the moon has changed. This has been followed on now by uh, other probes. I think the Cassini probe. Uh, Detected some signatures related to water ice Cassini? as it flew by the moon. Is, yeah, no. when, when they were testing. Oh, when it did the flyby. As, as, as they were the as they were flying by Earth, yeah. uh, they tested instruments on the moon. Uh, India sent a probe to the moon, which actually made other detections of water. Um, the moon became hot stuff. Uh, NASA had a program called Constellation that was going to build on the remains of the space shuttle program and get people back to the moon, just like Apollo. Um, and you know maybe even take advantage of some of this stuff. Um, now, that was a program that would cost probably more than Apollo. That had no political support really. I mean, they started it, but it, it, when the real cost of it came up, it, it looked like it was doomed. But some good came of it. Um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which right now is orbiting between 15 and 30 miles above the surface of the moon and photographing every square inch of it, uh, was the result of that. Also, um, the LCROSS mission, which was launched a Centaur upper stage into the south pole of the moon and followed it by a, a probe that watched the explosion that resulted confirmed that there was water molecules and uh, all kinds of stuff there. And so now, you know, we, we feel pretty certain, uh, maybe, I don't know, some, there's some doubt about how much water there is, but other studies even show that water might be sort of integrated better, more into the chemistry of the moon because it, it came from the Earth. You know, the big collision billions of years ago caused the Earth, both Earth and moon to form out of the same material. So there may be a lot more there than we thought during Apollo. And so what? We, well, so what? <laughs> the, the whole question of now we've got a hard out at nine thirty. No, no, we we can go a little bit past that. And, okay. Yeah. Um, no, even though we don't have much. We time We just have to, to get them out of here before ten, so they can. 
make their buses and okay. Get okay. Out so why go back to the moon? We go back to the moon to save our lives. We go back to the moon to do things, to do the things that will solve the critical problems that we are facing in the next 25 to 50 years. That we also go back to the moon because this opens the door to solving the problems that threaten to end, at a minimum, human civilization by the end of the century, if not the human race and most of the life on Earth entirely. That's why we go back to the moon. Solve problems, save our tukas. Now, why is that? Near term, big problem facing us is energy and pollution. And that could be, you know, toxic chemicals. It can be gases that, cause, that raise CO2 in the atmosphere, which cause climate issues. Those are big problems, you know. Energy, because without energy, nothing can be done. With inexpensive energy, anything is possible. With expensive or non-existing, non-existent energy, nothing is possible. So we got to solve the problem of energy. We got to solve the problem of pollution and environmental adverse environmental impacts. How do we do that? You can look at various suggestions that people have made for solar power, wind power, and fill in the blank. Ain't gonna work. If you were to try to convert to generate the power needed in this country by the end of the century using wind and ground-based solar, you'd be using something like two-thirds of the land mass of the country for solar, pa solar panels and wind turbines. It's not going to work because that's basically paving paradise to have the power you need to run the rest of the country. So is there a solution? Well, some people might say nuclear. But in order to do nuclear, you have to go into a massive breeder, you know, breeder reactor program and generate literally millions of kilograms of plutonium and, and highly enriched, enriched uranium so you can run the reactors. Seeing as it only takes a handful of, of plutonium or enriched uranium to make a bomb, this is really kind of a dangerous situation, probably a non-starter. So nukes are out, wind, solar, ground-based solar, they're all out. They won't solve the problem. We could, we could use, we could frack the bejeebies out of the earth and use natural gas, coal, you know, whatever, and then we'll cook in the dark when the climate changes. None of those work. But there is one solution that works. Actually, there's two, but I'll just mention one because we don't have a lot of time. Um, solar power based in space and then beaming the energy down to the earth. It sounds like a crazy idea. It sounded like a crazy idea when it was first proposed back in the 1970s, and it continues to sound like a crazy idea to people who have not run the numbers. You gotta run the numbers. How big, how heavy, what's the transmission efficiency, all the other stuff. And you run the numbers and it works. In fact, there was a big study done by NASA and the Department of Energy back in the 1970s that said yes, Space-based solar power was competitive with ground-based baseload power in the United States, but it needed the launch cost to be down under $100 a kilogram. Guess what? With SpaceX and the, uh, the Falcon Heavy, we're not there. SpaceX and the Starship and the Super Heavy Booster, or whatever they're calling it this week, mm -hmm. we're there. And if we're not there, the next generation vehicle is. So we are almost at the point to where we have the launch capability that makes space-based solar power effective. So what? What's the big advantage of space-based solar power? It generates power, you know, the way it works is you have a large solar collector in space, and, and I mean large, five or 10 kilometers wide, 10 or 20 kilometers long. It converts solar energy into electricity, the electricity is then beamed down to the ground using microwaves, but it's a relatively low power density beam. It goes to an antenna on the ground and it can't go to any other antenna. They have to send a pilot beam up to the, to the solar power satellite to guide the beam. So you can't like turn it off at a city and cook a city. Now, that low power beam is converted into electricity on the ground and distributed into the grid. Quick calculation suggests that it would take about less than 2% of the available landmass in this country to generate all of the power we need 
using space-based solar power and rectennas. That's under 2%. The alternative green so suggestion or green solution is two-thirds of the land mass taken up by all of this stuff. But there's a big difference with microwaves and rectennas. Microwaves hit the rectenna, they're stopped. In other words, you elevate the rectenna on telephone poles. The rectenna is really simple. It's basically a bunch of dipole antennas. You elevate it up on, tele on what amount to telephone poles. Underneath that, you put a wire mesh Absolutely no microwaves get through to the ground, which means under that, farmland. You can turn that into farmland. So when you're dealing with space-based solar power, the antenna, the power plant on the ground, is a farm. It's the only power system where you don't have to choose between power and food, power and solving the greenhouse gas problem. I mean, think about it. This is a power plant that's not, pow that's not carbon neutral. It's carbon negative because the power plant is also an area that's sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. So it's a very attractive solution. Now, how does that relate to the moon? Because I just told you that we got to go back to the moon to solve this problem. Well, I haven't, you know, but I'm talking solar power satellites. Well, the best way to build solar power satellites is with material from the moon. What can we get on the moon? Aluminium, titanium, silicon, all of those things. We can get water, oxygen, and all those other things we need for rocket propellant and life support. We can get aluminum, aluminum and silicon, and we can make our solar power satellite in space around the moon. Lift the stuff from the lunar surface, take it to one of the Lagrange points, Build your solar power satellite there. Do it modular so you can do it in, in pieces. Ship it down to geostationary orbit. Guess what we've also done? Now, we are not using resources from the Earth. We're not using electrical power from the Earth to build the power satellite, to build the solar arrays and all the other stuff that go into this. We're using power and resources from the moon to do that, which means the energy and resource impact of building the solar power satellites is significantly reduced because we're doing it using lunar resources. And <coughs> because lunar gravity is low, and just because of where the moon is and all, the, all that other orbital mechanics stuff, which I would love to talk about because that's what I've spent 40 years working on, it's much easier to get stuff from the lunar surface to geostationary orbit than it is getting to geo from the surface of the Earth. In space, distance doesn't matter. It's energy difference and all those other things. And so in a real sense, the surface of the moon is something like eight times closer to geostationary orbit than the surface of the Earth is. So it's hugely easier to get your stuff to geo, which means it's even cheaper to build those solar power satellites using lunar materials. So we go to the moon, not for all the, all the fluffy things. We go to the moon for very hard-headed reasons. We go to the moon to save our tuchus because we need power, we need resources. Now, the first step is the moon Solar power satellites built out of lunar resources. There are other technologies that we might use, but we'll just stick with the one that's easy, solar power satellites. But also, we're there, we're mining this stuff, we've got propellant, all of these other things. This means this opens the door to all the rest of the solar system, Mars and beyond. Then the trip gets really easy if we start from the Earth-Moon Lagrange point using propellant taken up from the moon. So, that so we've, we've, got, we've taken care of the first 25, next 25, <laughs> 50 years. We've solved, the, we've solved the energy problem. We've got resources. We've got this stuff going. One bit now. You say 50 years is a long time off, but you know what? If we hadn't stopped going to the moon at the end with Apollo 17, today would be the 50 years in the future that I'm talking about now. So we would now have the energy problem solved and we'd have a whole different discussion. But this opens the door, and the door that it opens is the door to the asteroids. Because in the long term, I'm a belter. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up, I'm a belter. Now, um, not OPA, just belter. Um, now. As an asteroid belt, right. Yes. Yeah. Now, long term, 
What's the big problem the human race faces? Big, big problem, the problem that must be fixed, must, must be solved, is the resources of the world are horribly and equitably distributed. The, the first world, the industrialized world, has a few percent of the world's population. 10 percent, maybe. 15 percent if you're wildly generous. But it uses something like 80, 90 percent of the world's resources. This situation, and, and when we talk about poverty on a global scale, we are talking about poverty at a scale that most Americans cannot begin to imagine. I mean, a friend of mine once said, America is the country where the poor people are fat. In the rest of the world, poor people look like skeletons with parchment covering them. But in America, the poor people are fat. That's how rich we are. Now, I mean, in, in India, there are more people in India living on a dollar a day than there are Americans living in this country today. So there's this huge inequity in resources. There's, yeah, and, and you say, well, okay, let's work hard and raise the living standard of everybody on the planet. Can't do it. If it takes 80, 90 percent of the world's resources to provide a, a first world standard of living for 10 percent of the world's population, you ain't gonna raise up the other 90 percent with the remaining 10, 15 percent of the world's resources. It's unstable. It will not last. It will end in war, catastrophe, or you pick your disaster. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. If we think that all of the resources available to us are the resources on the earth, we're turning our back on the real wealth of the universe. The asteroids. Like I said, I'm a belter. The asteroids are where most of the resources are. Did a quick calculation the other day. An asteroid, about a kilometer in diameter, there are thousands of asteroids like that, hundreds of thousands of asteroids in that size class. An asteroid in that size of, of a composition that is unrealistically deficient in everything, water, metals, etc. But an asteroid of that size, would, if mined, would generate enough metals to satisfy the needs of the world for a year. One asteroid, mm -hmm. kilometer in diameter, satisfies the world's needs for metals for a year. If you look at asteroids in that size class, how many years, if we mined all the asteroids, if we mined just to the asteroids in that size class, we'd have enough resources for a quarter million years. Warren, if and I that's, understand. And that's just one size of asteroid. So, if I understand your, what you're getting at, uh, in order to mine asteroids, we'd need resources to start, start with from the moon. And the moon is where we start. No. The moon is where we start because that's where we get the water and all the other things we need to outfit our spacecraft to go deeper into space to go to the asteroids. So near term, the moon solves our problems for energy, and it open, and it's the doorway to the rest of the solar no. system, and the rest of the solar system solves our long-term resource problems. And that, that's true if the moon, in fact, has the resources that we think it does, right? It, and, and the way to sort that out is to go back and look. And right now, there's evidence that there's water. Yeah. Don't know the details. But uh, China, for instance, I mean, Warren isn't the only person who's thought this out. And uh, China actually is, has interest in, in finding out what's on the moon. So right at this moment, there's a craft on the far side of the moon called Shangi-4, which has been there uh, uh, since the uh, end of 2018. They have a relay satellite system so they can keep in constant communication with the Earth. And it's doing mineral surveys of a really interesting portion of the moon that's the deepest crater that goes closest to the center of the moon on the Aitken South Pole uh, 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 crater. And um, they've already made discoveries about the mantle of the moon. They're looking to see if there's any water uh, detectable in this area. So here's one country that has a space program. It's partly for, you know, a little bit for national recognition, but they know they're not the first on the moon. Uh, but they are, they are going back in a rather practical way, I think. In a very practical way. Um, 
their first orbiter about 10 years ago now. Um, not long after that, I saw a technical paper published by, by Chinese authors. They were using the data from their orbiter to map the location of helium-3 on the lunar surface. So they were mapping the areas where there were most likely Which could be the highest fusion, concentrations right? of helium-3. And helium-3 can be used for aneutronic fusion, which is fusion that does not generate the kind of radioactive waste that other fusion processes generate. And so it may be the key to, again, another key, another method for solving our energy pro problems. And I looked at the time, and I didn't have time to talk about it. But it's another, it's another yeah. thing we can what do. What I'd like to do, actually, briefly, is talk about what you know, what the United States is doing. Well, we have lunar reconnaissance orbit, <coughs> and you know, that's kind of an afterglow of the Constellation program. But we do have uh, things in the works. Uh, there's the SLS, or, or uh, uh, Space Launch yeah, System, say, don't slip. <laughs> which uh, is kind of an afterglow of Constellation also. It, originally, there was something called the Ares rocket that was built using space shuttle technology, and this is kind of the same rocket, um, maybe not quite as grand, but, but uh, it carries also something called the Orion capsule, which can carry, well, I guess the crew size originally was announced at seven, but I think most, most missions are pinned at about four now. It's also supposed to be an evolvable system, so not all Orion capsules will be alike. But this is actually something that's being funded, tested, um, it's way behind schedule and stuff, but uh, it is a program that's being worked on. What would it be used for? Well, one idea that out of many that have shifted around and changed over time is something called the Lunar Gateway. And um, this would allow a, a Orion capsule to dock to a mini space station. And um, the space station can be steered around. It has a, the solar pa panels that you see on the back uh, are also con connected to a propulsion unit, so it can change orbits and stuff. Um, various countries want to contribute to this. Uh, well, you saw a robot arm. Of course, Canada made the one on the space station. They want to make one for this. Well. Vice President Pence gave a speech uh, early, well, late in the spring, in which he said, well, we're going to move things up. Instead of waiting till 2028 to build all this stuff, we want to get people on the moon in five years. And with no mention of what the budget would be, what the plans would be and stuff. But the idea seems to be to accelerate things that are already in place. The first element of the Something Lunar else. Gateway has been uh, contracted. So that could fly. Um, if the whole thing is built as it was originally uh, said, various countries would contribute major parts to it, but not by 2024, certainly. Um, this is how big the Lunar Gateway is compared to the International Space Station. And this, again, is a, a space station that's much closer to the moon, I guess uh, 10,000 miles from the moon, something like that. Well, it's, it's in a weird-ass orbit. Uh, it's called a distant retrograde halo orbit. Um, and it's an orbit that, it's a polar orbit. It's very eccentric at its closest. It gets to, I think, 2,000 kilometers of the lunar surface. And it's most distant, it's like 70, 80,000 kilometers. Wow. It's, and it, it's a very strange orbit. So, so uh, I just like, Power seems to be a good reason to go back to the moon. Uh, also, uh, on the far side, you could probably do some pretty good astronomy. Uh, radio astro astronomy, it's... Yeah. But, but the thing, uh, the, the, the Tuesday panel mentioned that to get back to the moon requires a focus, national focus, and a timeline. Okay. And this, well, panel, well, this panel mentioned leadership. Uh, the, thing, the, the thing that's really missing is uh, a purpose. Uh, until there's an economic purpose yeah. to go back to the moon, we're never going to go back to the moon. And the purpose okay, well, could be let, to, to because we have limited time. I think well, uh, what we're going to do what we're going to do is talk about what the NASA plans are now. Excuse me. Gateway. What we'll do right now is we'll we'll continue this. We'll open it up to questions in, in a moment, but. Um, we, Another byproduct of wanting to get to the moon quickly, at least 
the administration's desire to, is that NASA now has a commercial lunar uh, landing or delivery service. And uh, a number of con companies now have been contracted to uh, be able to land experiments on the surface. Now, um, whether this will help at all with getting people there quickly, it certainly could help like universities and various places with uh, sending experiments there at much lower costs than we currently have. Um, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos he has a space company, uh, Blue Origin, and he's come out with a giant lunar lander called Blue Moon, which is now under development. And uh, this could be enlarged to carry like a crew carrier, but this is a reusable lander. It doesn't leave a descent stage. It, it takes off and goes back to the, uh, the lunar gateway, if possibly. And, and by the way, he timed his announcement right after Pence's oh, yes. speech, which I thought was... Yeah, right. and, and he admitted it had been under development for about three years, yeah. and they're already testing engines on it, stuff like that. So this likely will get built. It's Jeff Bezos's money. Um, Billion a year. And again, the uh, power station for the gateway it looks like it'll get built. Um, how about Orion? Well, Orion depends, as we currently see it, on the SLS booster, which is running way behind schedule. But SLS should launch by 2021, 2022, something like that. The first mission of, of Orion and, and the uh, SLS will be to take an uncrewed uh, Orion capsule on a very uh, complicated path close to the moon and far from the moon on a 25-day mission and then return it to the Earth. Uh, see if that works. Uh, the next mission would then carry a crew on that same mission. And it looks like around the third or fourth mission, if they try the 2024 timeline, would be to send up a minimal gateway. It might be like one inflatable module from, say, Bigelow or something, that uh, power unit that should be in space by then, and then joining the uh, Orion to it, and then uh, some as yet unknown lunar lander. And then that would just be able to go down to the surface. Now, because we don't have developed spacesuits like we had in Apollo, we have you know, space shuttle type suits and uh, maybe a few advances since then, it's, it's seen that this visit to the moon in 2024, should it occur, will be very brief. It'll be opening the door, stepping out on the surface, probably planting a flag, and then getting back in. It won't be walking around or exploring or doing any of that. It's really. I think, from what I understood from the speech, it's really to get us, you know, working and get to the moon on that schedule and get things going, and then let the other stuff unfold. That I don't was, think he addressed the whole EVA thing. He just said he we did, do it. He, well, not there. Actually, David, <coughs> you said that, that uh, Bridenstine, the head of the uh, no. administrator of NASA, said that it would be a very brief visit. Well, they're visit. not addressing any of this. Oh, none of it yet. That's not how they're selling the program, but that's besides the point. No, he says, we'll meet the 2024 dot timeline. I wish I could quote him, but I can't. Uh, if it means we hop down to the moon from the gateway, open the door, step out, walk around on the moon for a few minutes, and then get back in and come back up in the gateway, and we will have landed on the moon by 2024. And so that's basically what they said. Again, I'm not quoting him. So do they need a, a, a lunar spacesuit that's dustproof for that? I don't, I don't know. And, you know uh, but, but this, to his point and to anybody's well, point. Before we, before we tear it apart, actually, what, I just want to say what, the thing, what, what is picture, what's being kind of stated by NASA or reading between yeah. the lines. The other thing is that was stated by the vice president was that um, it's date-driven, not hardware, not, uh, you know, what was it? Not capability driven. Not capability driven. So, so instead, if, if SLS is not ready in time, SLS won't be the one doing this mission. And he said there are, there are uh, other, uh, other players. SpaceX, which is building the, uh, the, ro the Starship, uh, could have capability of yeah. carrying people directly to the moon. And the other possibility is Blue Origin is also building the New Glenn rocket, which is another giant rocket that may have tremendous cap payload capability beyond the SLS, and it might be ready in time. Before, before you open this up, I really, uh, there's about 30 of us in the room, I guess, right now, maybe. I'd like to know, by show of hands, 
how many of you know that there is in play right now a program to return to the moon called Artemis? How many of you are familiar with it? I, raise your hands, please. So I got two hands being raised out of There's maybe 20 people. Now. Okay. There's two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, eight. How many of you work here? <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay, so now, the, now, how many of you know anything about the plan, Artemis, the details? Does it inspire you? Does it make you feel that we really have to go back to the moon? Is there a reason why we're doing this? Anyone, do you, you think that it's inspiring to you? No, um, what Warren, Warren will say is that it's more inspiring. <laughs> I, no. I, 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 <laughs> Does anyone know why we're doing Artemis? I mean, other than the vice president says we're going in 2024. I guess I'm trying to find out how much of Artemis is really understood or, or our effort to go to the moon is understood by those in the room. Does the program speak to anybody? Well, well they, haven't, they have hardly articulated what it's going to do other than go to the moon by 2024. Uh, it, it is a badly articulated. They haven't articulated what they're well, going to do. Well, and what is there? So you said, why are we going? Okay, you, you kind of took it a, a deeper level than what Warren Until was talking about. Purpose, we're, we're never going to go back to the moon. And, <laughs> and, and, and the purpose could be to generate power to a gateway or to do astronomy or something. So in other, in other words, if, if... In the 70s, we already walked around and collected rocks. We've already been there and done that. Until there's a purpose... We're never going well, to so, so if NASA, for, for instance, or the administration were to say, we're going to the moon like to uh, power the future, and here's how, and put a clear picture to it, that might yeah. convince well, so you. Yeah. We, we really, to have a really good moon program that is going to work, and the people are going to get behind it, and we're going to see it actually happen, rather than have another government program get scrapped, which is what's happened with every effort we've had since Apollo to go back to the moon or to do anything other than fly around in space in circles. You, it, there needs to be this vision, this importance, this connection back to the people. So see, China's going to the moon to do something for China, and the people know that. And what Bridenstine talked about and Scott Pace talked about and others, it's we're going to go to the moon and it's going to help us get to Mars. And that's not resonating. And nobody's talking about using the moon like Warren's talking about. There are some entrepreneurs that want to go up there and mine it, but they're at a much lower level because the truth is they don't have the funding and the technology. They're far behind what a government program can finance. They can be really important and they can evolve over time and in time they'll be wonderful, but that's not where they're at today. So why go back to the moon? You need to have something like he's talking about or maybe something else that we can get behind and then it needs to be sold. Well, I think that's one reason Pence started that speech by talking about our enemies in space with, with China and Russia, which I found a little disingenuous and kind of surprising because I think the Russian program is going to slow to a crawl once we stop hiring them to fly us to the space station. Well, I mean, so they're going for a, a reason to benefit their, their nation and to mm -hmm. do things like what Warren's talking about. And we don't know why we're going, but maybe it's to go learn how to build cheaper spaceships to go to Mars. Well, maybe. It's hard to do nationalism I will say twice. China has said that they plan to have a demonstration solar power satellite operating in geo in 2035. And, and by the way, Japan does too. Yeah. So yeah. those are two countries. And India is going to the moon. Their, their launch was delayed from last week. Their website is isro.gov.in. You should check it out. They're going to be putting a probe into the lunar soil. They're doing some incredible lunar science to f help find out in answering the questions that Warren's been talking about and we've been talking about. We're not sending that stuff to the moon. So the disconnect continues, and it's really frustrating. And then to say we're going to spend all these billions of dollars and Congress needs to approve this and we need to continue to be leader, it's just frustrating. I mean, I don't know how to say it any other way. We want it to happen, but we want it to happen and to be valuable for us. David, we've got a question back here. Like, 
it, you know, the current political climate doesn't help us in any way, shape, or form no. No, it doesn't. to get us to where we want, we need to be. I mean, I, I feel like as I've been listening during the 1950s and the 60s, it seems like the imagination of the American people was set on what more is out there, this kind of idea of exploration. And right now, the, the current political imagination or the imagination of the American people is, how can I do X, Y, and Z? It's not, what more is out there? Let's go out and do more. So I think the focus of, of any administration that wants to get propel these ideas forward has to be, and I don't know how correct this is, but has to be, you know, Americans need to have this, this vision of, let's unite. Let's actually do something. Let's actually prove to the world that, you know, we can come together, that we can do something, and we can achieve this for all mankind. Because Apollo was that. Yeah, it let's not the over, over glamorize the Apollo era. I mean, those of us were around then. Even as kids, we knew that the nation was really very fractured about this. There are a lot of people that thought it wasn't a great idea. There are a lot of people that were more upset about Vietnam. There are a lot of people that thought we should be pushing civil rights and patching potholes and building bridges and railroads and all this kind of stuff. So it wasn't quite the golden era. And it's interesting you bring this up because I just had a, I edited a magazine. I just had a, a student give me an op-ed which said, you know, the country was united behind, it was just like that argument I was telling you about that I had with Zubin. The country was united behind Apollo and it was this golden era and we've lost so much and so forth. And I, I kept writing, I kept sending him this thing back saying, look, you got to look at the data, okay? So, look at the, Gal hold on, look at the Gallup polls, look at all the material from that era, look at some of the political writing from that era. You know, look at protest films that were you yeah. See on I mean, people CBS standing out in front of the gates at, at Kennedy Space Center saying, "We don't want this to happen." Do, you know. So, I, I, so I take your point, we're but getting let's messages not over from beyond it. saying that we need to. Uh, wrap up in, I barely got moment. to talk in the last forty-five yeah. minutes. But, but, but testimony from yeah, the Senate that is last good. week. That is but it sounds like talking about. we're kind of in agreement, almost everybody. I mean, that if there was a clearly stated advantage to society and our future to going to the moon, then that might actually be what uh, sells it, right? Yeah, that's good. Send those cards um, and letters to NASA. So, uh, oh God, Congress, I, I just yeah. want to very do this very yeah. briefly. Um, what do you think the moon will be like in 100 years? Rod? <laughs> Probably a lot <laughs> like sense. Earth, for better or worse. <laughs> Like with people living, yeah, it? it'll, it'll be a little nicer than Barstow. You know? <laughs> no, I think I think it'll be fairly well developed. There'll be some light industry there. I'd love to see Jeff Bezos's dreams come true. I think he's a visionary, and he's been saying the same thing since his valedictorian speech in 1982, King which is David, kind of what we're talking right. about. I, I I think there'll be uh, some lunar development, some lunar settlement, some uh, light industry, and I think the cis lunar space, Earth to Moon, will be commercially. Um, improved and built upon and will be in play and be helping to develop the moon even further and go further. So don't forget the cislunar space. Morin? Oh, I think the, the moon will be not the home of light industry, it'll be the home of heavy industry. I, I think it will be a large and thriving commercial entity with mining of the moon for various reasons, building solar powered satellites, producing materials for going out into deep space. It will, it will be a thriving area with multiple large cities, multiple large business enterprises. Um, you could have a population of several million people on the moon and in other regions in cislunar space. Um, and I think it will be supporting large industrial activities there and beyond. And that we will see at that point a large amount of industrial activity in the asteroids, in near-Earth asteroids, maybe the main belt, but I think mostly the near-Earth asteroids. The one thing I cannot tell you is what language will those people be speaking? Will it be predominantly English or will it be predominantly Chinese? Yes, and we can't answer that question. So can, I, can I add one more thing? Yeah. One thing not to overlook, and we haven't talked about it tonight, is we really need to advance human factors and life support. And we are not ready to sustain life on another planet or the moon, and we have to learn how to do that. And there's a lot of progress that has to be made in order for any of these visions to come right. about. And that should be a topic for a whole other talk. Another whole thing, but I, I just didn't want to end without all of you thinking this is slam dunk. 
for oh, humans to no, live no, on the no. moon or any place in space, it's a big deal. It's not and because we it's gotta easy, develop it's it. because it is hard. It's because it's hard, absolutely, um, and costly. <laughs> right, so uh, we're gonna wrap up for the live stream audience now, and thank you for, so much for giving us so much to think about. And, uh, and actually, I think, actually ended a bit on a bit of optimism that there maybe is a way to, uh, you know, sell the moon, in a way. So, so thank you. And, uh, and uh, so, farewell from Griffith Observatory. And uh, thank you for the Warren. opportunity, Tony. Thank, and thank you so thank much. Thank all of you for staying till ten o'clock at night. All right. Yeah. So, uh, in uh, so now.